I always thought of home as a place filled with whispers of the past, each corner holding a memory, each shadow a secret. That's what it felt like coming back to the old, sprawling house where I grew up. I'm Carson, by the way, a 22-year-old college student, usually buried under a mountain of books. But this time, I was buried under decades of dust in our attic. It was spring break, and instead of spending it at some wild party or relaxing on a beach like my friends, I was home. My parents had roped me into helping them sort through years of accumulated junk in the attic. They both worked for the government in jobs they couldn't talk about much, which always gave our home an air of mystery. With them often busy or away, the house felt larger and lonelier than ever. The day I arrived, the house was unusually quiet, the kind of silence that presses against your ears. My little sister Sadie, just a year old, was probably the only source of real noise around. She was taking a nap when I walked in, her tiny chest rising and falling in a peaceful rhythm that contrasted sharply with the chaos of stuffed animals and blankets around her. Make sure you check all the boxes thoroughly. We don't want to throw out anything important, my dad instructed with a seriousness that made it sound more like a mission briefing than a cleaning guide. His eyes, hidden slightly behind thick-rimmed glasses, always looked tired these days. The attic was a maze of old furniture, boxes filled with forgotten photographs, and trunks with clothes that smelled of mothballs and memories. As I climbed the creaky ladder that led up, a cloud of dust welcomed me, swirling in the beams of light that struggled through the small attic window. Sorting through the attic was like stepping back in time. Each item I pulled from the boxes told a story. My grandmother's old sewing machine, my father's collection of vinyl records that he cherished, and countless drawings I had made as a kid, each proudly marked with a crayon scrawl. But the real task was to decide what stays and what goes, an emotional tug of war. The hardest part was handling the objects that felt like they still had life in them, whispering secrets of the past that maybe I wasn't supposed to hear. It felt odd, unsettling almost, to disturb these resting pieces of history. As I dug deeper into the memories, the attic seemed to shrink, the walls inching closer with every old letter and photograph I examined. It was in these moments, surrounded by the debris of the past, that I truly felt the weight of the family legacy on my shoulders, a legacy shrouded in secrecy due to my parents' mysterious jobs. Little did I know, tucked away in a forgotten corner under a dusty tarp, was a discovery that would change the course of my visit. It was an old, locked closet that I had never noticed before. Curiosity peaked. I felt a mix of excitement and apprehension. This was not just another afternoon sorting through old junk. This was the beginning of something entirely different, something that would unravel in ways I could never have expected. The dim light bulb hanging from the attic's rafters swung gently as I moved past, casting eerie shadows across the cramped space. I wiped the sweat from my brow, the dust turning the sweat into a muddy streak across my hand. I was ready to call it a day when my best friend Theo, who had come over to help, shouted from the far end of the attic, Hey Carson, check this out! Theo, always the adventurous one, stood by a tall, narrow closet I couldn't recall ever seeing before. Its dark wood seemed to absorb the weak light around it, making it appear almost sinister. It's got a lock, he called out, his voice echoing slightly in the confined space. Curiosity overcame my exhaustion. As I approached, Theo was already fiddling with the lock, a mischievous grin spreading across his face. Dude, it's not even locked, he exclaimed, a note of surprise in his voice. We exchanged a glance the kind that friends share when they're about to leap into something unknown together. All the warnings from my parents about areas off limits in the house buzzed in my head, but the thrill of discovery pushed those thoughts away. With a shared nod, Theo swung the closet door open. Inside, the closet was deeper than I expected. Hanging there, illuminated by the trembling beam of Theo's flashlight, were two bodysuits, so incredibly detailed and lifelike that they made my heart skip a beat. They were replicas of my parents, my mother's with her gentle smile and soft eyes, my father's with his stern brow and the familiar tilt of his head. The suits hung silently, 
their empty eyes seeming to stare right back at us. The air felt thick as Theo and I stood there, staring at the suits. The initial thrill of finding the closet gave way to a creeping unease. This is insane, Theo whispered, his usual bravado faltering a bit. Why would your parents have these? I reached out, almost against my will, my hand shaking as it brushed against the synthetic skin of my mother's suit. It felt disturbingly real, like touching cold human skin. I don't know, I murmured, my voice barely a whisper. But this... This is something they've never mentioned, ever. Theo, curiosity overtaking his initial shock, stepped closer, running his fingers along the material. These must be super expensive. Look at the detail. It's like, like they could walk out of here any minute. A part of me wanted to shut the door to pretend we hadn't seen what lay inside, but another part, the part that thrived on mysteries and secrets, wanted to delve deeper to understand the purpose behind such eerie replicas. We should look around, I suggested hesitantly. There might be more to this. As we sifted through the closet, the back panel shifted slightly under Theo's hand. Hey, what's this? He said, pushing against the panel. It moved inward, revealing a hidden compartment behind the closet, a compartment filled with various documents, photos of my parents in various disguises, and notes in languages I couldn't immediately recognize. The revelation hit me like a physical blow. My parents, their jobs, the locked rooms, the secrets, they all suddenly painted a picture far more complex and dangerous than I had ever imagined. The suits weren't just bizarre artifacts. They were tools, perhaps for deception, protection, or something darker. As Theo and I poured over the contents of the hidden compartment, the weight of our discovery pressed down on us. This was no longer just an attic cleaning, we had stumbled into a hidden world, one that lay just beneath the surface of my family's normal facade, and with every document we read, the reality of my parents' double lives became harder and harder to ignore. As Theo and I delved deeper into the hidden compartment, our hands fumbled across more than just paper and photographs. We found official-looking documents stamped with warnings and non-disclosure agreements. They confirmed the suits were part of my parents' elaborate security protocol for their government work. According to the documents, these suits were decoys, intended to be used in emergencies to mislead and protect. The notion felt like something straight out of a spy movie, not something that belonged in my parents' quiet, mundane lives, or so I had thought. We're literally living in a spy novel, dude, Theo said, his voice a mix of awe and disbelief. He held up a photo of the suits in use, staged in a scenario that looked alarmingly realistic. The seriousness of what these suits represented, a life fraught with danger and secrecy, sank into my bones, chilling me despite the stuffy heat of the attic. With our discovery laid bare between us, a mischievous glint sparked in Theo's eyes, one I knew all too well. Hey, Carson, think about it, he started, an impish smile playing on his lips. The house is ours for the weekend. Your parents are away, and here we have these... These amazing suits. What if... I raised an eyebrow, already dreading the end of that sentence. What if what, Theo? What if we took them for a spin, just for a day? Come on, it would be epic. His enthusiasm was infectious, but the idea of stepping into my mother's suit felt bizarre, almost sacrilegious in a way. Are you insane? I laughed nervously, trying to brush off the suggestion. That's way out of line. But Theo wouldn't be swayed. Okay, how about a bet? We play a round of Call of Duty. If I win, we spend tomorrow as your parents. If you win, we drop this whole thing. The challenge hung in the air, heavy and tempting. My rational mind screamed that it was a bad idea, yet there was a part of me, perhaps the part that always wanted to know more, to explore further. That was curious. The thrill of the unknown the thrill of stepping into another life, even if it was just for a day, was enticing. All right, fine, I agreed reluctantly. One game, but if it feels weird, we stop, no questions asked. Deal! Theo clapped his hands, already heading toward the gaming console set up in the living room. We played in silence, the tension thick. Every kill and every death felt weighted with the stakes of our bet. In the end, Theo's skills outmatched mine, 
his character dancing around mine with an agility I couldn't counter. The screen flashed his victory, and a sense of dread mixed with excitement settled over me. So, it's a deal then. Theo grinned, triumphant and buzzing with excitement. Tomorrow, Carson becomes Mrs. Carson, and I step into Mr. Carson's shoes. That night, I lay in bed, the reality of our bet sinking in. I was to spend a day in my mother's suit, walking in her very literal shoes. The idea was ludicrous, yet a part of me was curious about how it would feel. To look out from behind another face, to see the world through her eyes, even if it was just a mask. The thought kept me awake, a mix of dread and curiosity churning in my stomach. What had I gotten myself into? Was this just harmless fun? Or were we stepping into something much deeper? Something that might change how I saw my parents forever? The morning after Theo's predictable victory was a mix of apprehension and an odd sense of anticipation. As we stood before the closet, the suits hanging there felt like a challenge, a gateway to an experience so out of the ordinary, it was hard to fully grasp what we were about to do. Theo, ever the instigator, was the first to break the silence. Well, let's not keep your mom waiting, he joked his humor a thin veil over the undeniable tension in the air. I approached the suit that replicated my mother with a mix of reverence and disbelief. It hung there, eerily lifelike, the details in the face and hands so precise it was unsettling. As I touched the suit, the synthetic skin was cool and slightly rubbery, but the resemblance to my mother's warm, familiar touch was uncanny. Here goes nothing, I muttered, and with Theo's help, I began the process of donning the suit. The inside of it was lined with a myriad of sensors and mechanisms, all designed to ensure a seamless transformation. As I stepped into it, the suit felt cold and alien, a stark contrast to the comfortable clothes I had just shed. Once the suit was pulled up to my waist, Theo helped me zip it up at the back. The moment the zipper closed, a soft whirring sound began, and I could feel the suit tightening around me conforming to my body's shape. It was an odd sensation, like being gently squeezed by a hundred hands, each one expertly molding the suit to mimic my mother's physique. Next came the mask, the final piece that would complete the transformation. It was the most disconcerting part. As I held it in my hands, looking into what would be my eyes for the day, the reality of what we were doing hit me fully. This wasn't just a game, I was about to erase Carson for a while and become someone else entirely. Ready? Theo asked, his voice a mix of excitement and concern. As I'll ever be, I replied, trying to steady my breathing as I pulled the mask over my head. It fitted over my features snugly, the edges blending seamlessly with the rest of the suit. Tiny motors whirred, adjusting the fit, tightening here, loosening there, until the face looking back at Theo was not my own but my mother's. The transformation was complete when I spoke, and a voice that wasn't mine came out. My mother's voice, programmed and perfect, a haunting reproduction. How do I look? I asked, the sound making me shiver. You look just like her, man, Theo said, his voice a mix of awe and a hint of fear. It's uncanny. We then proceeded to help Theo into my father's suit, and soon he too underwent the same startling transformation. Standing side by side, we looked in the mirror. It was surreal. We were ourselves, but not ourselves. Theo, now embodying my father and I, as my mother, shared a look of mutual bewilderment. The weight of the suits wasn't just physical, it was profoundly psychological. Moving around, I could feel the suit's technology adjusting continuously, changing the way I walked, the way I held my head, even the way I would normally gesture. Every minute adjustment made me less like Carson and more like my mother. As we stepped out of the room, ready to face the day, the line between reality and role play blurred. I was no longer just wearing a costume. I was enveloped in an entirely different identity, seeing the world through eyes that weren't mine. The adventure we thought we wanted was underway, and it was nothing like either of us had imagined. It was deeper, more complex, and it was going to challenge us in ways we couldn't yet comprehend. The morning sun cast a warm glow as Theo and I ventured outside. 
the oddness of our attire hidden beneath casual clothes that my parents might wear. It was a surreal experience stepping into the daylight, feeling the suit mold my every movement and adjust my posture. My mother's gentle demeanor and subtle gestures were no longer just observed traits, but something I was embodying. Each step I took was carefully calibrated by the suit's technology, making me sway slightly, mimicking her distinctive walk. Our first encounter was with Mrs. Jennings, our next door neighbor, who was out tending to her garden. Her wave was friendly and familiar, and as she called out, Good morning, Helen! My automatic response was a gentle, Good morning, Barbara! in the perfectly modulated tone of my mother. Theo, now my father, offered a polite nod, his demeanor perfectly capturing my father's reserved nature. The interaction was disconcerting. Mrs. Jennings didn't hesitate in her approach, discussing neighborhood gossip and local events as if it were indeed my mother she was speaking to. The suit's AI prompted responses, feeding me lines that sounded exactly like something my mother would say. I found myself slipping deeper into the role, the boundaries between Carson and this constructed persona of Helen blurring. Theo and I continued our walk, heading to the local grocery store. It was a place my parents frequented, and as we walked through the aisles, more acquaintances greeted us. Each time, the suit's technology nudged my reactions, aligning them more closely with how my mother would behave. Theo, too, was not just in a suit, he was transforming, his body language and responses so uncannily like my father's that it sent a chill down my spine. As we interacted with more people, the suits adjusted and fine-tuned our behaviors further, pushing us deeper into our roles. The technology was impressive, terrifyingly so. It wasn't just about looking like someone else, it was about becoming them. The more we interacted, the more the suits learned and adapted, enhancing the deception. Confusion seeped into my consciousness. With each passing hour, I felt more disconnected from myself. Was I Carson pretending to be Helen, or was I slowly just becoming her? The lines were fading, and with them, my grasp on my own identity felt increasingly tenuous. The real test came when we bumped into a family friend who invited us for coffee. Sitting there, discussing matters my mother was passionate about, community projects, school events, I found myself speaking passionately about topics I had only ever heard discussed from a distance. My opinions were hers. My mannerisms echoed her enthusiasm. Theo, too, engaged in conversations with a depth that mirrored my father's perspectives on politics and economics. As we left the coffee shop, the weight of the experiences pressed heavily upon me. The confusion was no longer just about who I was at the moment, it was about the very nature of identity itself. How much of who we are is just a collection of behaviors and responses conditioned over time? And if technology could so easily manipulate these, what did that say about our own realities? Walking back home, the suits continued their subtle orchestration of our identities, and I wondered if I'd ever fully step out of this persona, or if part of it would linger. A ghost of someone else's life lived through my body. The adventure Theo and I thought we wanted had morphed into a profound and unsettling journey into the essence of identity, leaving us both silently questioning everything we thought we knew about ourselves and the people we thought we were impersonating. As the sun began to set, casting long shadows across the streets, Theo and I found ourselves seated at a local restaurant, a place my parents often frequented on quiet, unhurried evenings. The ambiance of the restaurant, with its soft lighting and gentle murmur of conversations, seemed to amplify the surreal quality of our experience. We had chosen a secluded booth, perhaps subconsciously seeking to shield ourselves from further interactions that would deepen our immersion into our roles. As we settled into the seats, the waiter approached, greeting us with a familiar nod. Evening, Helen Tom, he said, handing us the menus. His casual acceptance of our disguises unnerved me, but by then, the suit had fine-tuned my behavior so well that I responded with my mother's gracious smile, thanking him with her characteristic warmth. As Theo and I scanned the menus, I suggested dishes I knew my parents would choose, my preferences subsumed by the persona the suit created for me. Theo, looking increasingly uncomfortable, merely nodded and agreed, his earlier enthusiasm waning under the weight of the role he was trapped in. The conversation between us, 
initially lively and filled with our usual banter, began to falter as the evening wore on. The suit's influence, which had seemed a technological marvel at first, now felt like a cage, shaping my every word and gesture with uncanny precision. As I spoke about community issues and shared anecdotes that were my mother's and not mine, I noticed Theo's discomfort growing. His responses became shorter, his smiles forced. The rift between us widened with every course that arrived at our table. I was lost in the role, seamlessly weaving through conversations with the waiter and other patrons who stopped by our table to say hello. Theo, on the other hand, was visibly retreating, his participation dwindling to monosyllabic replies. Finally, he set his fork down, his expression tense. Carson, this isn't fun anymore, he said quietly, his voice strained. It's like I'm not even with you. It's like I'm having dinner with your parents. I paused, a fork full of salad halfway to my lips, and realized I couldn't remember when I had last spoken as myself. The realization hit me hard. The boundaries between Carson and Helen had not just blurred, they had been obliterated. I felt a pang of fear. Was I losing myself to this technological facade? You're right, I said slowly, setting down the fork, my mother's refined movements still dictating my actions. I, I don't know how to turn it off, Theo. It's like I'm stuck. Theo's eyes met mine, filled with concern. We need to get out of these things, Carson. It's messing with our heads. His voice was low, urgent. Nodding, I felt a rush of gratitude for his presence, for his ability to remain anchored, despite the bizarre situation we had thrust ourselves into. Let's go, I agreed, eager to escape the restaurant and the roles that had overtaken us. We left hastily, abandoning the meal and the personas that had consumed us. The cool evening air felt like a splash of reality as we stepped outside, but the relief was temporary. As we walked back towards my house, the suits continued to assert their control, compelling us to maintain our assumed identities. The evening had started as a playful adventure into our parents' world, but it had transformed into a profound and unsettling exploration of identity and authenticity. The line between self and simulation, once so clear, was now a confusing tangle that we were desperate to unravel. As we hurried home, the need to reclaim our true selves was no longer just a desire. It was an imperative. The journey back to my house was a silent, reflective march under the dim streetlights. With each step, the sensation of being trapped within another person's skin intensified, pressing upon us the urgent need to escape. As we entered the quiet sanctuary of my home, the familiar surroundings contrasted sharply with the foreignness we felt within ourselves. Once inside, Theo and I frantically searched through the documents we had found earlier, desperate for any information on how to remove the suits. Our hands trembled as we rifled through papers and files, the panic setting in deeper with each fruitless search. The suits, which had seemed so intriguing and harmless at the outset, now felt like prisons crafted from silicone and circuitry. In our desperation, I remembered a family friend, Dr. Emily Hart, who had always been particularly close to my parents. She was involved in technological research and, perhaps crucially, might know something about the suits given her frequent private conversations with my parents. With shaky hands, I dialed her number, my voice barely concealing the panic as I explained our situation. Dr. Hart's voice was calm, a stark contrast to our frantic tones. Stay right there, I'm coming over. She said with an urgency that reassured us help was on the way. The wait for her arrival was agonizing, each minute stretching out interminably as Theo and I sat in silence, lost in our own tumultuous thoughts. When Dr. Hart arrived, her presence was a beacon of calm in the storm of our turmoil. She examined the suits with a professional eye, quickly identifying the mechanisms locking them in place. These are equipped with a fail-safe release, but it's programmed not to engage until certain conditions are met. Let me disable it, she explained as she worked deftly with tools she had brought. With a few precise adjustments, Dr. Hart deactivated the suit's locking mechanisms, and for the first time in hours, Theo and I felt the grip of the suits loosen. We shed them like old skins, stepping out as if reborn. 
The relief was immediate and profound, a physical unburdening that mirrored the emotional release we both felt. As we sat there, now back in our own clothes, Dr. Hart offered us a gentle, understanding smile. Sometimes trying to understand someone fully by walking in their shoes can be more complex and challenging than we anticipate, she said. Her words prompted a deep, introspective silence between Theo and I. The experience had changed us. We had sought a day of escapism, an adventure in the guise of others. Instead, we confronted profound questions about identity, empathy, and the boundaries of self. We realized that the act of assuming another's identity, even superficially, carried with it unexpected and profound consequences. Theo and I spent the rest of the night discussing our experiences, our conversation a mix of philosophical reflections and emotional revelations. We talked about how the suits had not only altered our appearances, but had influenced our thoughts and behaviors, pushing us to confront the essence of who we were beneath our external identities. It's one thing to imagine someone else's life, but another to live it, Theo remarked, a note of somber realization in his voice. I nodded in agreement, feeling a newfound respect and empathy for the complexities my parents must navigate in their secretive work. The adventure into our parents' skins had started as a game, but ended as a journey into the depths of ourselves. As dawn broke, casting a soft light into the room, Theo and I knew we would never again underestimate the profound intricacies of stepping into another person's life. We were changed, not just in how we viewed others, but in how we understood ourselves. In the quiet aftermath of our ordeal, Theo and I took it upon ourselves to securely lock away the suits. We placed them back into the hidden compartment behind the closet, this time ensuring that the secrets they held would not tempt or endanger anyone unprepared for their profound effects. We locked the compartment, the click of the mechanism sounding final, a closure to an episode that had irrevocably altered our perceptions. In the days that followed, the house felt different to me. It was as if I could sense the echoes of the lives my parents led, lives filled with burdens and secrets I had only just begun to understand. The suits, now out of sight, remained a symbol of the hidden depths of identity and the double lives my parents endured for their work. The experience had imbued me with a newfound empathy not just for my parents, but for everyone around me. Understanding the weight of another's existence the roles they play and the masks they wear had opened my eyes to the complexities of human identity. It was a profound realization that each person is a tapestry woven from an array of threads, some seen, but many unseen. With this understanding, I felt a strong desire to bridge the emotional and communicative gaps that had long existed in my family. I started spending more time with my parents, asking about their days with genuine interest and offering insights into my own life. Slowly, the walls we had built, underpinned by secrecy and necessity, began to crumble. One evening, I initiated a conversation with my parents about the suits and what Theo and I had discovered. I approached the topic with sensitivity, recognizing the delicate nature of their work. To my surprise, they did not shut down or evade as I had feared. Instead, they shared their own experiences and the reasons behind the existence of such technology. This conversation marked a turning point, opening up channels of communication that had been stifled by mutual reticence and secrecy. My relationship with Teo, too, had deepened. We often reflected on our experience, discussing how it had changed our views on personal identity and empathy. Our friendship, already strong, was fortified by our shared journey into the very fabric of our beings, and it expanded our capacity for understanding and supporting each other in new, more profound ways. As weeks turned into months, the lessons gleaned from that intense day continued to resonate. I found myself more patient, more curious about the lives of others, and more appreciative of the intricate dance of appearances and realities that each person navigates daily. In a way, the suits had served as a harsh but necessary teacher, they taught me that to truly understand another, one must look beyond the surface and reach into the essence of their experiences and struggles. And while I would never wish to relive that day, I am grateful for the indelible changes it wrought in my perspective and relationships. The suits remain locked away, 
but the echoes of their lessons linger in the corridors of my daily life, a reminder of the profound journey I undertook with my best friend, a journey that taught me the true meaning of walking in someone else's shoes, and in doing so, coming to a deeper understanding of my own.